Pounding. That's what that you. What was that? I do hear pounding now. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, nice. I'll mute myself in the meantime. I just want to make sure we can hear you. So, good afternoon. This is Noelle. I apologize for the delayed start. There's some technical difficulties with GoToWebinar, which um, I guess we should have anticipated. We had a beautiful practice session and then went to log in today and had some glitches. But uh, I recognized uh, it sounds like we have um, Donald on the phone and Mary Lou. Hi, right. right. Noelle. Hi. And do we have Kevin with us? I don't know um, what the um, background noise is. Sounds like construction happening somewhere. Yeah, it's, Noelle, sorry, I've actually got some people working on a heating unit right above me. <laughs> and okay. I'll try to mute when I'm not presenting, I'll just mute myself. Okay, perfect. And I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if I heard Kevin. Did anybody hear Kevin? Yes, I'm here, Noelle. Can you hear me? Oh, I can. Great. Thank you. Sure. So, well, terrific. I want to welcome you all to um, our colon cancer webinar today, um, sponsored by the Intertribal Council of Michigan. Just getting acquainted with um, somebody else's computer. <laughs> um, these are basically um, our goals for today. We're going to uh, review the guidelines and use of the um, FIT. Um, to detect colorectal cancer. Um, it's similar to the FOBT that everyone's familiar with. Um, and provide information to help clinics uh, choose the brand of fit that might work for you and your population. We will hear about um, a current research study that's being conducted among tribal clinics and programs in the southwest part of the US using the fit um, and their results thus far. And then we'll also learn about the state-sponsored colon cancer screening program, which I think some of our tribal clinics um, populations may be able to take advantage of. We have three terrific presenters today. I just want to briefly um, introduce them and give a brief bio. We have Donald Haverkamp, who's an epidemiologist with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. He works to increase colorectal cancer screening among diverse communities as in current, and is currently the leader of the Indian Health Services Task Force for Colorectal Cancer Screening. We also have Dr. Kevin English, who's the director of the Albuquerque Area Southwest Tribal Epicenter. Kevin's been working with tribal communities across the country since 1995 as a researcher public health practitioner, and clinical pharmacist. We also have Mary Lou Searles with the Michigan Department of Community Health. She's an RN with over 30 years of nursing leadership experience in acute care, and currently the program manager for Michigan's Colorectal Cancer Early Detection Program, which is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and oversight provided by the Michigan Department of Community Health. Just briefly, I wanted to share some uh, colon cancer facts and figures with the group. This is specific to American Indian populations here in Michigan. Um, according to the State Cancer Registry, uh, colon cancer is our third leading cancer among American Indian men and women in Michigan. For some individual tribes, it is the first and second leading cancer. The mean age of diagnosis for those uh, with an early or late stage colon cancer is around 59.6 for American Indian men and women compared to 68.49 years for the general population. So we consistently see a younger age at diagnosis among our population. Um, screening rates are varied by different data sources. And I just listed a few here just to kind of give us some idea. Um, in 2008, the Intertribal Council of Michigan did a tribal-specific BRFAS with seven tribes in the state. And at that time, we found that 37% had had a blood stool test within the past two years and that 58.9% had had a sigmoidoscopy or a colonoscopy at least once in their life. And a little more recently, um, this is just a snapshot of a handful of clinics um, and their GIPRA um, reports. So we can see among four clinics, um, our colonoscopy screening rates are quite varied from about 20.8% to as high as 53.9%. And our FOBT and or FIT uh, screening rates vary from uh, zero to as high as 16.9%. So I think we're all familiar with the need for improved screening um, as colon cancer is preventable and uh, very treatable when caught early. 
So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Mr. Haverkamp. Kevin, I think you should have the screen here momentarily. Or Donald, sorry. Is that right? <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. I apologize if you hear any banging in the background. They're doing some. Uh, they're installing a, a new heating unit right above my head, actually in the next room. So I'll try to mute myself after I finish my uh, presentation. I wanted to take a few minutes today um, to thank Noel for inviting me to speak. And I know it's an important topic, especially in the Northern Plains, where colorectal cancer is such a, a problem with high incidence and mortality. So I appreciate the chance to, to speak about um, in particular, the fecal immunochemical test for colorectal cancer screening, which we'll focus on for a few minutes here today. <clears throat> I wanted to start off just by um, really uh, emphasizing the importance of screening and what a difference it can make. You can see here, um, these are five-year survival rates by a stage of diagnosis for colorectal cancer. So um, you can see that people who are diagnosed with early stage colorectal cancer, which is like stage one or two in the diagram up to the right, um, where colorectal cancer hasn't yet made it through the wall of the colon or rectum. Um, if, if the diagnosis is made in that stage, survival rate is very high. About 90% of people uh, have a five-year survival rate um, after their diagnosis, whereas um, if people are not diagnosed until the cancer is very advanced in late stage and gone on to metastasize to different parts of the body. Um, survival rate has decreased to, to about 13 percent. So it's a dramatic difference and, and uh, you can see the, the importance of detecting cancer early or, or even preventing it altogether. And in this slide, um, I have to show data slides since I'm an epidemiologist, so excuse me. But this is my only other data slide. But I just wanted to show that uh, compared to non-Hispanic whites population, um, you can see there's a much higher percentage of cases for American Indian Alaska Native people being diagnosed at, at late regional or, or distant late stages. And that's what we want to change by, by increasing colorectal cancer screening hopefully boost up the number of the percentage of people who are diagnosed in early stage of disease. So basically we're looking at uh, trying to increase screening and what you know what's the best screening option especially in Indian country? Well in, in the United States as a whole colonoscopy uh, as you can see in some of Noel's um, statistics has kind of become the utilized method most utilized method in the United States. Although um, there's a new initiative out called 80 by 18 to try to get, uh, to try to reach 80% of screening for eligible population by the year 2018, which is a pretty lofty goal, which I think uh, overall in the U.S. we're about 66% up to date with screening. But basically the, the message is we're not going to get to that 80% by just do, focusing on colonoscopy. We have to look at the other methods that are available for screening and take advantage of those and have patients be made aware of those options. <clears throat> because in the end, the best test is the one that gets done and gets done well. And those options do include not only uh, colonoscopy in current guidelines, but also flexible sigmoidoscopy. And also, <clears throat> we don't want to forget about this whole category of fecal occult blood tests, which we'll talk about today. And as far as evidence for, for effectiveness of, of these screening methods, um, there have been plenty of randomized controlled trials that show the effectiveness of FOBT. Um, you can see here on the right, just highlighted the, the, the amount of uh, mortality reduction due to screening with this method. So it's a very, it can be a very effective method for screening. Um, if done on an annual basis. 
but basically now with uh, fecal occult blood testing, there's actually uh, two types of tests out there now. The, the older type of guaiac based stool test are all these tests are looking for hemoglobin in, um, in, the, in the feces. But uh, the guaiac based tests are looking for the heme portion of uh, the hemoglobin um, through uh, peroxidase activity. Whereas this newer type of FOBT, the FIT test, fecal immunochemical test, is actually looking for antibodies that detect the globin portion of hemoglobin. So it's a big difference, and we'll see some of the advantages to, to actually using the, the FIT test over the older guaiac-based test. The guaiac-based FOBT is still probably the most commonly used type of FOBT in the, in the U.S. Um, and again, it detects a peroxidase-like activity of heme, the heme portion of hemoglobin. Now, typically, this test requires uh, a lot of effort on the part of the patient, requiring two samples from three different bowel movements uh, for an in-home test. And we use a little stick to smear the, the stool on, a, on these cards and send them back. Uh, it's a very inexpensive test. Uh, you can see here, 2 to $3. Um, and Medicare reimburses actually at a higher rate than that. Um, and most insurance companies, I'm sure, uh, reimburse for uh, FOB test, FOBT testing. Now there are plenty of issues, as we as we all know, about using guaiac-based FOBT. One of the main ones is that there there are dietary and medication restrictions um, required before the test is completed, due to the fact that it's using this peroxidase uh, activity um, to read for heme. So and this ends up creating a lot of false positives, especially in people who have um, bacterial infections such as H. pylori in their in their gut, and it, which can cause gastric bleeding and then lead to false positive um, uh, test results for when you use guaiac based FOBT. Um, and then, so again, this is one reason that patient's acceptance is very limited when using this test. We hear all the time that people just don't send these uh, tests back in when they're given the test to patients. Um, and also the method of specimen collection using the, the little stick and having to smear stool on cards and all that. It's just not a, an acceptable method of screening for many people. The other issue, the main issue, is that it really detects bleeding from the entire GI tract. As I mentioned, you could have bleeding in the stomach that could, be, that could lead to a false positive um, uh, colorectal cancer screening test when using this type, type of test. Um, it's not as an objective type of um, interpretation of the test. You can see a little uh, sample on the on the right. There are a photo of, of the test. It's positive, um, and it's not. This test is not amenable to actually automated development or interpretation. So there's more room for error when interpreting the results. And then another main problem is providers are still using uh, what's called a a single office. Sim, uh, single sample test following a digital rectal exam. So after they do a rectal exam on someone, they they have feces on their finger, they smear that on a FOBT card and, and call that adequate for screening. Um, and that has been shown to not be an effective way to, to screen for colorectal cancer. So there's still a lot of that happening as well. And as far as, there, there are several types of guaiac-based FOBT still. However, uh, guidelines only recommend using uh, high sensitivity uh, tests for screening. Um, and really, that's, I think that's down to the hemocult sensa. If you're going to screen with the guaiac-based test, that would be the one you'd want it to use for screening. Now, this other type of test that we mentioned is the fecal immunochemical test. And again, this uses antibodies to detect the globin portion of the hemoglobin. And because of this method, um, you're basically just looking for uh, bleeding in the large intestine, which is what we want to find, um, because the globin does not survive um, in the stomach, basically. It's kind of degraded before it gets past the small intestine. So, so by the time it reaches the large intestine, um, 
it's been broken down. So if there's any bleeding in the large intestine, that's what the fit will detect. Now we've, we see that much better sensitivity and specificity using uh, fit when compared to the Guayac test, is, which is what we want to see. The test is a little bit more expensive. As you can see here, I think the prices may have gone down uh, um, since I made this slide, but but Medicare still uh, began, began coverage for this test about a decade ago, and the reimbursement rate is still around $23, which is going to cover the cost of the test. And most insurance companies are going to pay for this uh, the test to be done as well. Now, some examples, there's many companies out there making the FIT test now, which is can be kind of confusing. Uh, here's a sample of a few that are on the market that have been FDA approved. Um, the ones that I'll mention briefly are the ones that I have checked here, the Hemocult Insure and the uh, Polymedco uh, test. These are ones that have been really used in some studies and uh, there's been some published data about their sensitivity and specificity, etc. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those so you can see basically the different types of tests that are out there and the uh, different stool collection methods that are available as well. So the first, again, is by the, the Hemocult, um, <clears throat> the company that makes Hemocult. So it's a familiar name, but this is actually, instead of the Hemocult Sensor, which is Guayac based, this is the um, Hemocult ICT. So again, they've stuck with their, their stool, stool sampling method of using the stick and smearing that on cards. Uh, and it til still takes three stool samples. But again, the, the main difference here is there's no dietary restrictions. You don't have to stop eating meat three days before, uh, you know, red meat three days before you take the test or stop taking aspirin or, or vitamin C and all these different restrictions are no longer there. So, so I think patients are more apt to do the, to go ahead and complete the test. Uh, another example just to show you the difference in the stool collection method is a test called Insure. In this test, there's actually no fecal handling at all. Um, the patient um, stool sample is uh, basically brushed. The, the surface of the stool sample is, is brushed while it's in the water, and then excuse me. Then this you brush the actual brush of the water onto the card and send that back to the lab. And this this one actually only requires two samples as opposed to three for the hemocult ICT. So an entirely different collection method and people may be more more apt to complete this, this sort of test. Um, we actually did a study in Alaska recently uh, looking at the use of FIT and whether it was a, a, an option, would be an option for patients, Alaska Native patients, given the fact that they tend not to use guaiac-based FOBT at all anymore due to what we talked about earlier with um, there's a high prevalence of people that have H. pylori infection, which causes ulcers and also can cause bleeding in the stomach. And uh, so there was a lot of false positive tests, and they just decided they were just going to go with colonoscopy for Alaska Native population. However, with this study, we, we actually did enroll people who had both of uh, the FIT test, the GWIAC test, and a colonoscopy and looked at results and, and really found some results that uh, support the use of FIT for the population in Alaska. For example, the overall positive rate, false positive rate, sorry, for GWIAC-based tests was 24 percent, where FIT was only 8 percent. And then when we looked at uh, just people who had H. pylori infection, we, would, we saw basically what we thought we had saw, an increase in false positive results for the Guayac test, but there was no, actually a slight decrease, or about the same for the uh, insurer fit. So we saw results that we wanted to see there, and there's few false positives. It's a much easier test to, for patients to complete, and it's actually been recommended in the Alaska Medical Center, uh, Native Medical Center guidelines now to include fit as a screening option. And then a third type of test, um, just to show a different stool collection method, we have uh, the Polymedco fit check test. Um, this is actually a single sample test, which is great. 
people just have to do one sample from a single stool specimen, um, collect that stool onto a little probe, and then stick that probe back into a vial and send it off to the lab or back to or you know back take it back to the clinic. And this actually this test can actually be um, automated and read interpreted by uh, by machines if you're doing a, a high number of these tests. And in fact, this test was done uh, was used in the study that Kevin will be talking about next. So basically, just to summarize, really some of the advantages of using FIT over the traditional uh, GUIAC-based test, you have greater sensitivity for colorectal cancer um, compared to the GUIAC test. There's no dietary or medical medication restrictions before or during the test, which is a great advantage for, for, for the patients. And we're, this test only identifies human blood in the large intestine. So it's, uh, again, you're much less likely to have false positives from, from this type of test. And again, as we have seen with the example, specimen collections um, allow for less stool handling and patients have more choices and are more apt to do this type of test and get it back to the, the clinic than with the um, traditional GUIAC-based FOBT. And then as I showed you, some of these tests, depending on the FIT test, can actually be developed and interpreted, by, interpreted through automation. And it's, you have much few, many uh, fewer errors when interpreting the results of the test. And so basically, I just wanted to summarize here as well. If you're going to use a screening uh, test, a population-based screening test with FOBT, these are some of the things you want to remember to do. Again, use only these high sensitive, high sensitivity GUIAC-based FOBTs if you're going to use the, the GUIAC-based ones, or use a FIT test. Uh, again, stay away from using the in-office FOBT after a digital rectal exam because it's just not an effective method uh, for picking up uh, colorectal cancer. And have patients do these uh, tests in their own home versus doing them in the clinic. Uh, follow up with patients who have a positive FOBT by doing colonoscopy, which is a very important, important second step for screening. And then finally, if you are going to do these tests, they need to be done on an annual basis. Uh, sensitivity is very much decreased if this test is all, it's only a one-time test. It needs to be re repeated uh, on an annual basis and that needs to be communicated to, to patients. And finally, I have one, just one program I wanted to mention that can kind of re reinforce this whole idea of having patients um, repeat their test on an annual basis because this, this is a program that's been shown to be uh, well accepted by patients and has been in place in places like Kaiser Permanente in, um, uh, in California, for example. And they've had a lot of success in increasing the screening rates. Um, and basically the idea is to combine uh, the flu vaccine when people come in for their flu shot to also reach them at that time by giving them a fit kit to take home and, and, and uh, test for colorectal cancer screening and then have the patient um, you know, bring that back to the lab or, or mail it back. And it's been uh, shown to really be an effective method of increasing the screening uh, quickly, actually. So and I put the uh, uh, URL, the website, down at the bottom if you guys want to check out the website. And it's full of um, all kinds of resources and um, slides and everything and everything you need to do to really put that program into place in your in your clinic. So that's all I had. I, I don't know, I, I guess you might want to leave questions till the end. Noel, is that uh, what we want to do? Yeah, I think if we leave them till the end that would be best. They can also type questions. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Well that was my presentation. I'll, let's see how I can turn it over to Kevin. Um, Kevin, I, I just made you the presenter, Kevin. So there, okay, there you great. Go. Thank you. Let's get the slideshow up here. Okay, does everybody see the uh, next set of slides? Yep. Yep. Okay, well, again, thank you for... Hello? Yeah, we're here. 
Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, so much for including me on your agenda today. Um, as Noelle mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about a um, study that we're doing here in the Southwest in partnership with three tribal communities, as well as Don from CDC. Um, we have a larger colorectal health program here that I'll also share a little bit of resources with um, all of you as well at the end. Um, essentially, our study was trying to look at ways that we might increase the return of completed FOBT kits um, within tribal communities. Um, one thing that we have found, at least here in the Southwest, is that while in many cases it's still challenging to get um, the providers to always recommend the tests on a consistent basis, it's even more difficult to get folks to return the kits back to us um, and make sure that um, folks are completing their tests on an annual basis. So instead of just looking at the traditional usual care approach here, which is um, waiting until somebody 50 to 75 comes into the clinic that's due for screening and then providing a recommendation, we actually are looking at testing other methods um, for getting the kits to patients. And those include sending out the kits, as well as mailing out the kits and having a CHR or community health representative follow up with the patients um, to try and increase the return rates um, of the FOBT kit. And so, as I mentioned, we're working with three tribes here, and what we're doing is we're testing all three groups in each tribal community, and then we're aggregating the data across all three communities so that not only can we see um, if any of these different methods for disseminating FOBT kits is perhaps better than others, also we can assess any intertribal differences. Um, so we have three groups um, where folks are being randomly selected to within each of the community. Uh, group one is usual care, group two they're receiving a mailed kit, and then in group three they're receiving the mailed kit plus some community health representative outreach. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that entails in just a minute here. But just so you know who we're including, we do utilize the United States Preventive Services Task Force Guidelines. Um, so we're focusing on men and women aged 50 to 75, uh, tribal members who live in the community, and those who are not up to date with colorectal cancer screening. And as we've already discussed, that means no FOBT in the past year, uh, no flex sig in the past five years, and or no colonoscopy in the past 10 years. Um, there are a few people that we're excluding from the study. So anybody with a recent cancer, or colorectal cancer screening exam, um, we're also not including those individuals who have personal histories of colorectal cancer or who have had a total colectomy, because obviously their screening guidelines would be different. So we're really looking at those average risk folks. Um, for this particular uh, study. So the intervention period, we began with just a review of the protocol in each of the tribal communities. We really tried to design the protocol in a way that was not burdensome, but rather it just kind of built right into the local healthcare system um, protocols that were already in place for colorectal cancer screening. Um, we, of course, trained the CHRs prior to beginning the intervention to make sure everybody had the same information around colorectal cancer screening around how to use the kits that we selected for the study. Um, we kept the same kit in each site. And then we had a six-month intervention period, which went from May to November, where we assessed and essentially um, disseminated the kits and tried to see if there were any differences in the return. So just to give you a little bit more detail on the three study groups, so usual care. So these are folks that were um, randomized to this group. Um, they met the eligibility criteria. And they really essentially had to come into the clinic in order to receive a kit. Um, because usual care here, at least in the Southwest, is that if a patient shows up age 50 to 75 and the provider or someone else in triage reviews the chart and identifies the need for screening, then it's recommended and or disseminated to the patient to complete the kit. All three of these um, sites currently do utilize FOBT as their primary screening test. Um, They're not using their contract health dollars to support screening colonoscopy. Um, so in this group one, there is no CHR intervention. There's no mailing. It's just essentially if the patient comes in, they get the kit. So then in study group two, this is the mailed kit. And so we included more than just the kit, recognizing that this is a new way of disseminating this particular screening exam. And we wanted to make sure that folks had information rather than just a test kit that came to them that they had to figure out why they were even getting it. Uh, so we did a customized letter um, that was signed in all three sites by both the clinic director and the CHR director. Um, there was also the kit as well as an instruction sheet, um, which I'll show you in a minute. 
Um, we opted to use the PolyMed Co kits that Don just talked about. We like the idea that it's a single collection. We like that it was a fit kit. We also got excellent pricing on it. We actually only paid, I believe, around five dollars for the entire kit, and the part that actually gets mailed to the patient, which is the patient kit, um, was closer to around two dollars. So the overall cost in this intervention was actually quite low because the more expensive component of the kit stays within the lab and only is utilized if the kits come back. Um, we also wanted to test different ways for returning the kit. So not only are we looking to see does the way we disseminate the kits make a difference, but if we give patients the opportunity to perhaps return the kits through the mail, would they actually take advantage of that? So um, all of the return envelopes actually had been pre-stamped so that it allowed um, any participants, any patients, to go ahead and just drop the kit into the mailbox. If for some reason they didn't want to come back to the clinic, we had heard a lot of information and um, concerns about possibly patient confidentiality and or just barriers, transportation barriers and whatnot in getting back to the clinic to return the kit. Um, but again, study group two had no CHR intervention, so this was just the mail kit. There was a follow-up reminder letter about eight weeks out. Here's the information sheet that we um, actually borrowed from another study that was happening at Northwestern using this same kit. And so in addition to the instructions that come standardized with the kits, we also include this particular instruction sheet, which really obviously uses visual images to help folks uh, better understand the collection methods uh, for completing the kit. All of these materials are available, too, if anybody's interested in using this product or if you're already using this product. And then finally for study group three, so in this case the participants received the same mailed kits as study group two. The only difference was in their letter there was an additional sentence that um, let them know that a CHR may be following up with them um, in the not too distant future. Um, and so then the CHR outreach was really structured around up to three outreach sessions um, that were either telephone calls or home visits and they were designed to take place in four week intervals following the mailing of the kits. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in um, detail here. So in session one, um, we focused on a telephone, telephone call. We wanted to start with the lowest cost, lowest time intensive intervention to see if after just the mailed kit and a phone call, if we got much of a response back. For those individuals who still hadn't returned their kits after four weeks, they got a telephone call. Um, the CHRs made up to five call attempts. Then if after four more weeks the kit still had not come back, the CHRs then conducted a home visit. Um, this took place, as I said, four weeks later, and they made up to three attempts. We recognize that this is more labor and time intensive to make the home visit, so we didn't go beyond three attempts. And then finally for session three, we went back to the phone call. So again, four weeks after outreach session two happened, if in fact the kit still hadn't come back, the CHRs um, made phone calls again. So that was the CHR outreach that got added into um, the mail kit. Um, we also developed a protocol that was fairly straightforward so that all of the CHR programs would hopefully be conducting the same type of outreach and sharing the same messages during their outreach. We developed a flip chart as well. CHRs have told us from time to time how important it is for them not only to have information and knowledge, but to have tools that they can use, especially visual tools that they can use to educate their community members and show them what it is that they're talking about. Um, so we do have some of these flip charts available as well, and there's also an electronic flip chart that I can show you how you can access. Uh, important to note here how, how critical it was that CHRs and labs interacted because, of course, we didn't want the CHRs to be you know, following up with folks who had already returned their kits, and we did find that this collaboration really hadn't been in place prior to this study. So this was another component of our intervention, really trying to make sure those lab directors were following up with CHRs in a timely fashion so that once a kit came back, and if it was somebody in study group three where the CHRs would otherwise be doing outreach with them, that they actually knew that the kit was back and they could stop um, that process. So we were trying to encourage at least weekly check-ins between CHRs and labs. Um, if you're interested in how folks handled any positive findings or negative findings, um, we pretty much went with the standard operating procedures at each site, which was if it was negative, a letter went home within two weeks, um, letting the participant know that their result was negative, but reminding them to come back for those annual screenings. And if it was positive, then they went on for a colonoscopy referral. The preliminary findings, um, this is all I have for data right now, and I'll talk a little bit 
more about our next steps for analysis. So as you can see, in all three groups, we actually had pretty low response rates, um, which unfortunately isn't unusual for our area. Um, in two of the sites, this was by far an increase for them, which is um, still way below where we want to be. Obviously, we're talking about 80% by 2018. We have a long way to go. Um, but what is telling, I think, from this data is the fact that our usual care group um, still had by far the lowest return rate, and we saw a, you know, a threefold increase um, just by mailing out the kits. A pretty low-cost intervention seemed to um, triple the return rate of our kits. Um, so that's certainly interesting for us and you know, a potential um, leverage point for future intervention. Um, our future testing. And then as you can see, with the CHR outreach, we had a little bit of an increase beyond that, but not nearly as much as I guess we were anticipating at this time. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about what our next steps are for analysis, um, because we have plenty more data to look at. Um, we're still in the early stages of looking through it, though. Um, but before I get to that, I just want to share some of the challenges and limitations that we're aware of right off the bat. And one is, and it may be true for your facilities as well, we did, even in just a six-month period, and in the planning um, period you know, leading up to the intervention, we had a fair amount of turnover, not only within the CHR staff, but also at the clinics. We even lost one of our lab directors. Um, so this is obviously a concern. Um, it's not new, and it's not unusual, um, but it did make it maybe a little bit more difficult for us to um, necessarily see the impact that we were really hoping to from um, especially the CHR intervention. CHRs also let us know that you know, they had competing work demands, and the outreach um, schedule was hard to adhere to. Um, and so we have data on that. The CHRs kept their own tracking databases, so we're starting to wade through that to better understand how many outreach sessions actually occurred with CHRs and patients. And that'll help us better understand if, in fact, you're not going to see much of an increase from the CHR um, follow-up beyond the mailing and or if the CHRs just really weren't able to adhere to this protocol and how we might be able to work to encourage their involvement but find a way to weave it into their already um, fairly busy workflow. Um, in many cases, we did have a lot of missing addresses and telephone numbers, which made mailing the kits and or the outreach a little difficult. Um, the missing addresses, it was around maybe 10%, so it wasn't too bad that came back return to sender. Um, with phone numbers, it was also tricky um, for the outreach component. In some cases, the CHRs had to go right to home visits if they didn't have a phone number or if the phone number wasn't working. And then we do work with some communities here that, especially amongst the older population, and keep in mind we're focusing on those age 50 to 75, where the primary language is not English. Um, and for our study, the materials that we had, the written materials at least, were in English only. So we recognize that as a potential limitation of our project here. One of the next steps that we're doing, obviously, when you do any type of randomized controlled trial, you want to make sure that everybody gets the full benefits. And so for those group one participants that didn't receive the mailing, since we only focused on a six-month intervention period and the screening recommended interval is one year, we're now mailing out the kits to those who were randomized to group one to make sure they got that part of the intervention as well. Um, and that's just, we think, good practice to make sure that we're trying to get the screening rate as high as possible. And then we have plenty of additional analyses to do. We want to look at the differences in kit return by age, by gender, by tribal community. We also want to look at those return methods. How did the kits come back? Is the return postage necessary? Or can we just assume that the mailing, the initial mailing out is what makes a difference? Um, so we want to look and see how did the kits come back? Were they hand carried by the patient? Did the CHR bring them? Or did the um, postal service bring them? And we have data on that that we're looking um, we also plan to conduct some focus groups and maybe some key informant interviews with our CHR participants to better understand what their challenges were, what either facilitated their ability to do the outreach or what constrained them. We need to look closer at the clinical outcomes. We obviously track that as well to find out what the rate of positivity was, how many folks went on for their colonoscopy, um, what referrals were made, et cetera. And then we finally want to look at some cost analyses, too, to better understand you know, how much um, the intervention really costs per completed um, FOBT. So we'll be in touch soon, hopefully, with some of that information as well to share with you. And then finally, I just wanted to point you to the direction of some resources that you may or may not be interested in looking at um, for your own programs. We have a website, tribalcolorectalhealth.org, that has a variety of information there. There are digital stories and videos that you can access. There's radio public service announcements. 
There's PDF copies of reminder cards and brochures, posters. There's a variety of resources that you can pull directly from this website. We've also developed some patient or provider detailing cards um, that we can certainly send you to share with the providers in your community to make sure everybody's on the same page regarding the United States Preventive Services Task Force guidelines. We even created a DVD that has um, several personal stories around colorectal cancer, as well as some instructional videos on how to prepare the toilet for an FOBT test and several different collection methods um, for FOBT testing. Um, we can send you copies of that. It's also accessible to stream right off of that website. There are customizable um, patient reminder postcards. Um, these come out, I believe, like four by five-ish. And on the back page, you can type in uh, the health center's phone number, your health center name, um, whatever you want to put in there for contact information. Um, those are also downloadable from that website. And then this is just an example of a poster that we have copies available that we can send to you. Um, and one of our brochures that we've recently developed, um, it's a trifold, so it looks a little awkward this way, but just to give you a sense that we are trying to develop some culturally appropriate materials, at least for folks down this way, um, that can be utilized in some of the education, outreach, and awareness building activities. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Here's my contact information, and um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions after the next speaker, or offline if you want to reach out to me by email or give me a call. So thank you. Mary Lou, I'm going to send it your way here, hopefully. Sounds good. So while I'm not seeing anything. Pardon me? I'm not seeing anything. Is your screen, say, connected to GoToWebinar? Uh, yeah. OK, we see your screen. But I don't see my slides. So go so you down. need to pull them up on your computer. Oh, change. Do I have to hit Change Presenter? Uh, no, it looks like yep. you are the presenter. So the only thing I see is connected to GoToWebinar. Hmm. Yep, and we see that too. So you just pull up your slides. You have my slides. Did you download them? No, this um, GoToWebinar doesn't work that way. You just pull them up on your computer. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well. I can send them back to you if you need me to. Beautiful. Are we there? Yes, we are. Okay, perfect. Yep. All right, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of buzz through a few things. And I work with MDCH, and we um, want to let you know that Michigan is in the fifth and final year of the CDC grant to increase colorectal cancer screening rates. And we've committed to um, increasing screening to 80% by 2018. And we're working through the Michigan Colorectal Cancer Early Detection Program to do that, working with our partner organizations. We have a small colorectal cancer screening program, and we also have um, a system and uh, policy approach where we're working with organizations such as ITC, health systems, and providers to increase screening. A little bit of information about the colorectal cancer early detection program. And throughout this presentation, you're going to see links. Just click on them later, and you'll be able to see information about the program, location, contact information, et cetera. We, um, men and women aged 50 to 64, are eligible for this program. So you could send any man and women or woman who is low income, uninsured or underinsured, at average risk for colorectal cancer, or an increased risk for colorectal cancer to one of the health departments or organizations that's working with this program. As far as eligibility for the program, average risk clients are going to be screened by an FOBT. We decided to use FOBTs because with our funding, 
we thought we would be able to provide the maximum outreach for our program. We do know that we may have more false positives with an FOBT compared to a FIT, but that is the choice that we've made, and we're using a high sensitivity kit, as Donald talked about earlier in his program. Our increased risk clients are being screened by a, are being screened by a colonoscopy, and those clients have either a personal or a family history of colorectal cancer or precancerous polyps. The average risk clients are really at risk just because they're at age 50 and they know have, they have no personal or family history. And just a little bit of information, about 85% of the population is at average risk, and those clients outside of this program are able to choose any recommended colorectal cancer screening test that they wish to complete because it's important for them to have a choice and they have a better chance of completing their screening. In Michigan's program, we actually have a completion rate for FOBT kits of 85%, and the patients who are referred for colonoscopy actually have a completion rate of 90%. And we do that with patient navigation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So with the FOBT kit we use, we make sure that the tests are completed at home, they're completed annually, and that all FOBT kits that are positive are followed up with a colonoscopy. All of this is all of these services are paid for through the program. Just a reminder that digital rectal exams are forbidden. It's really not a recommended colorectal cancer screening at all, and so we want to make sure that no swipes are done on uh, FOBT cards or FIT kits and considered a screening. It's it's just not recommended. So increased risk clients through the program receive a colonoscopy. And again, that's personal history of either colorectal cancer, early stage, or precancerous polyps. So perhaps they've had a colonoscopy before and they've had polyps, they would qualify for a colonoscopy. Or if they have a first degree relative with colorectal cancer or precancerous polyps, they would qualify for a colonoscopy. High risk clients are not eligible for Michigan's colorectal program, and that really is because of the way the CDC has structured this grant. The locations for the colorectal program are at all of these health departments and Grand River Gastroenterology in Grand Rapids, Michigan participates in this program. So if you think that you have clients that may qualify this program that are um, interested in colorectal cancer screening that are age 50 to 64 and, and low income, you could contact any of these health departments. And the phone numbers are there. But if you click on the locations on this um, slide that I have, it'll actually take you to our website. You can see the counties where the program is available. It is in limited areas in Michigan. We utilize the um, evidence-based strategies found in the community guide to increase colorectal cancer screening. And that's how we, we focus our patient, um, patient navigation efforts. If you look on the screen here, you'll see that client reminders, small media, one-on-one -on -one education, and reducing structural barriers are all ways that we work with clients to make sure that they understand colorectal cancer screening and that they complete the screening. We also work with providers by um, encouraging them to use provider assessment and feedback and provider reminder and recall systems. When we talk to patients, and, and I would encourage you to this, do the same thing, we all talk to the LCA staff and, and encourage them to have three to five talking points about colon cancer. Make the message clear, make it succinct, make sure people know that their risk increases at the age of 50 for no other reason, just because they're 50 and that there are no early symptoms for colorectal cancer. So our goal is truly prevention. Make sure that people are getting screened, that if they have an adenoma or that precancerous polyp, that it's found early before it can turn into cancer. We provide patient navigation. We talk to patients, assess the readiness to screen. We offer risk-appropriate um, screening options, although it is set in stone as far as average risk are going to stop start with an FOBT and an increased risk client is going to get a colonoscopy. And we ask that question, do you plan on completing your screening? Because a lot of times patients may say, you know, I don't know, I just am not sure. And if that's the case, 
then you might want to say, hey, is it okay for me to talk to you in another three months? Or talk to them a little bit more in the office. We work with them about reducing structural barriers, and my next slide is going to talk about that. And we track and follow up if kits are not returned or if the colonoscopy is not completed. And that's the kind of um, conversation that Kevin was talking about with phone calls, with letters, with clients. And that's how we get that 85% completion rate with an FOBT. Barriers to screening are um, delineated on this slide, and these are the areas that we really focus on with our patient navigation, with our education with patients, to find out what is it that's stopping them from completing colorectal cancer screening. The strategies that we use that were found in the community guide is print, telephone, email reminders. Like Kevin said, you know, we, we mail out kits sometimes, we hand out kits in the office, self-addressed envelopes to make sure that the kits come back to us and get to the lab. If they're going to have a colonoscopy, we talk to them about the prep and the test, and we make sure we give them a call the day before the procedure to remind them, you know, have you got all your supplies and are you doing what you need to do? Some of the patient reminders, and this is a good resource for you, and I put this at the end of the slides, is NEO. It's called Make It Your Own. You can make your own patient appointment reminders. You can um, pick your own pictures, your own messages. It's all developed by a grant from the CDC at St. Louis University. This is an example of another postcard that you could use as a patient reminder. You can put your own logos in this information. Um, and this is the final one that I've shown. But there are just a multitude, a plethora of photos and messages that you might want to use and take a look. Just go to the website, sign on. Um, it's a free website. The only thing you do is pay for printing if you choose to print something. And I just encourage you um, to develop an office policy for colorectal cancer screening, just like we do with the Michigan program. We make sure that our staff are all educated about colorectal cancer, that they know how to determine uh, what the patient's risk is for colorectal cancer. The reminder systems are used, and all of the staff are involved. That's even the front desk. So that when somebody comes in, you might start sending, handing out information about CRC and talk to them, um, get them ready to talk to their physician about screening or their nurse practitioner or PA. I would encourage you to schedule colonoscopy appointments before the client leaves or make sure that you're passing that kit out before they are discharged. And of course, there's tracking systems for follow-up. So once the kit's out, it's really important that you make sure that you're getting it back or once you schedule that colonoscopy that you're making sure that it's done. This link will go to um, an ACS site that actually has some, some pretty nice tracking records that you might want to look at. These are, and I'm sorry for going so fast, I'm trying to keep this on time, but here's some resources that you might want to use. Um, American Cancer Society's got some other great resources too. Clinician, inf uh, clinician references, which are really good. The Make It Your Own site, those patient reminders that I talked to you about. Uh, that's the website where it's a free site. You just go on and develop your own reminders. So it works for your population. You pick pictures out that look like the people that you're working with. And it, it just speaks to people much more, and it's certainly much more helpful with getting them to participate in colorectal cancer screening. And all I can encourage you to do is start that conversation. They trust you. They're working with you. And when they hear the message about CRC screening from someone that they trust, it really makes a difference. You've got a much better opportunity to get screening uh, completed. And there's my contact information. If you have any questions about the Michigan program, be sure and give me a call or contact your local agency that was um, delineated on those slides. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you uh, to Mary Lou. Sorry for so fast. <laughs> you kept it. <laughs> Try to get it in. And to Donald for um, their wonderful presentations and all the information. At this point, I'm going to try to unmute everybody in case they'd like to ask a question. Um, you can also um, use the chat box on your um, computer screen if, if that's helpful.
So I'm putting everybody up here one at a time. Anybody has any questions? We have about five to ten minutes. I think we can retain questions. But I will also um, send copies of the slides. This entire session has been recorded, so you will receive a link as well as the slides. I know Mary Lou has some nice uh, hyperlinks in her presentation where you might want to access some resources as well. Any questions? Okay, well, not hearing any questions at this time, I'm going to, I know we're um, a little after 1 o'clock. Again, thank our presenters and thank our attendees. I um, really appreciate the expertise and all the information. Um, like I said, this has been recorded, so I will send links out. It will also be available on the ITCMI website, um, and you'll have copies of slides to access there as well. Any questions um, or further follow-up, um, HF presenters has shared their contact information, and you could reach me at noelp at itcmi.org or 906-632-6896, and I'm extension 107. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good day.